Hi everyone, welcome to lesson three of homiletics or practice preaching. Today we're going to look at how to do a celebration of life message. I like to call it celebration of life better than a funeral because when people hear the word funeral, it kind of gets them down. Let's begin in prayer. God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit leads us, guides us as we speak messages of your love, of your grace, and of your mercy. And as we look at celebration of life messages, that you'll speak to us so we are able to preach messages that bring hope to people when they're facing a death of a loved one or facing a tragedy or facing a loss of someone very close to them. We pray that we'll always speak your word in love, that we'll speak with the Holy Spirit and that your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and that we'll be merciful. Therefore, as our Father in heaven is merciful when we speak a celebration of life message. It will hear the stories of the family members so we can share memories that bring and uplift people. And God, we just pray by your Holy Spirit you speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to begin by reviewing some of the things we learned about in previous lessons. First of all, all our messages need three things. And by the time you get done with this class, you're going to remember them. And with a sermon, we need a fourth thing. First, we need a hook. We need to hook people in with our message. We got about one to two minutes to win the audience's attention. People have cell phones. People have busy schedules. They may be thinking about those things rather than the message. Number two book. We always got to have content in our message. So that when people hear our sermon, they have things that they learn and something new. Then we need took. They need to be able to apply the message to their life. And finally, as ministers of the word, we need a blessing. We need our congregants when they go out to feel the blessing of God. It says in Deuteronomy 28, 6, you'll be blessed coming in, you'll be blessed going out. And that's how our sermon should be. It should be a blessing to people and our messages should be a blessing so they come away feeling and experiencing God. And even if it's a conviction message, they should know that God's blessing will come as they seek God and turn from their sinful ways. And Matthew McCogliffe, author of Remember Death, wrote, Death spreads its poison through everything we enjoy because nothing we enjoy is ours to keep. Time passes, things change, and eventually everyone loses everything they love. And with that in mind, our message should lead people to the eternal one. When we preach a sermon or a celebration of life, we need to always bring people to God. We need them to know that God loves them. In their time of loss, God's their comforter. And also that in time of loss, the people around them, they're there to comfort them. Isaiah 40 verse 1 says, comfort, comfort my people. And we need to be comforters. We need not be like Job's friends where it says in Job 16.1, miserable comforters are you all. We need to be people who are filled with love, filled with grace, and filled with mercy to help those when they lose a loved one. And here's some five tips on preaching a celebration of life message. Number one, Share the person's life and make a message in a in narrative form. So you're sharing their life. Maybe begin with the from the time they were born and some things they've accomplished and ways they've been a blessing to people and the experience you had with that person. Number two, not every death is pretty. There's suicide or a young person who was murdered or a car accident. 34,000 people today will die in a car accident. And I have a cousin, and his son tragically died at 19 of suicide. And when you preach a suicide, you always got to bring him back to God. And you got to offer comfort and hope, because in eternity, we'll see our loved ones again. And with suicide, we need to treat it like any other illness. It's mental health issues. And when we see it in that light, and we realize if someone dies of cancer, we don't judge them. 
someone dies a suicide, we shouldn't judge them. In fact, there's a guy, and he was really strong, and he made it to Hebrews chapter 11, people of faith. And you know how he died? Suicide. Samson. He was between two pillars. Pulled open. The pillars fell on him, filled on the um, Philistines, and in his death, he had more victory than in his life. And some people struggle with mental health. And some, in their struggle with mental health, won't make it. They may commit suicide. They may die early. And we always lead the family back to God. Because God's mercy is greater than ours. God is a loving father. He lost his only son. And he lost him so he may gain us. And so that our death will never be lost. Because in Christ, we have eternal life. So someone who lost a son to tragic suicide, we need to lead him to the Father. And say, you know, the Father saw Jesus die on the cross. The Father gave his Son for us all, so we may have eternal life. And now, the Father and the Son, they bring us in with open hands. And preaching a funeral that's a celebration of life, for a suicide is going to be one of the toughest messages you may ever have to preach. In fact, I'd say it is. Number three, good scriptures for a funeral message and, or a celebration of life. And we're going to look at that. Number four, funeral message should be therapeutic in time of reflection and healing. Don't bring up the bad things that person did. That's the worst thing you can do. In fact, in a funeral, there may be weeping and wailing for the loss, especially when it's a tragic death of someone young. Number five, at the funeral, the aim is to speak on behalf of the family members in telling the story of their loved ones and celebrating the individual's life. So always celebrate the person. Always lift up the family. They're in a time of loss. They're in a time of needing a word that can transform their lives. And we're going to look at some good verses for a funeral. Number one, Ecclesiastic 7, 1 through 3. A good name is better than fine perfume. In the day of death, better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. And the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. And, of course, the most famous one is the 23rd Psalm, where it's the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that's a classic sermon message for funerals. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, this is one of my favorites. I've used this one at at least three different funerals. For this is... For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our angel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, meet the Lord in the air, and thus will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort when there be these words. And see, that's why I like this verse for a funeral. First, it shows that in Christ, we come back. We have a resurrection. And then it says this, comfort my people. And the celebration life message needs to be a message of comfort, a message of console, or a message of bringing healing and therapeutical. Then First Corinthians 15, 50, 57 now this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood can enter the kingdom of God, nor does a corruption inherit the incorrupting. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, and twinkle an eye at the last trumpet. For a trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For in this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must be put on the immortal. So when this 
corruptible has put on the incorruptible, and this mortal has put on the immortal, then shall be brought to pass the saying is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sin? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, there's a victory. It's in Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned before, the most common sermon um, passage for celebration of life or a funeral is the 23rd Psalm. And listen to it. Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me die down green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love follow me all days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And notice that David mentions fear. You know, I think the greatest fear that every person has is it's death. It's when we go to be with God, we fear leaving this world. This is the only world we know. But there's a life to come, eternal life in God, in Christ Jesus. And here's a couple other classic um verses that you can use for a celebration of life when it may be an unbeliever you're doing the funeral for. Ecclesiastic 3, 1 through 4. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. Time to be born, time to die, time to plant, time to uproot, time to kill, time to heal, time to tear down, and time to build, time to weep, and time to laugh, time to mourn, and time to dance. And also, with a sermon for a funeral, never, let me repeat this, almost never have it more than 15 minutes long. Sermon of celebration of life needs to be short, sweet, and be focused on that person who went on to be with the Lord or the family who needs comfort. And a good funeral will take at least 10 hours on the part of the pastor to write because he's got to visit the family, the friends. He needs to pray. He needs to craft this service and a homily to rehearse the message to officiate and to spend time with the family following the service. And he needs to spend time comforting. In a time of loss, you need to be comforted. And as I mentioned before, sometimes you may do a funeral for a car accident where a young person died or drinking and driving. And it may be even the driver who is drinking and driving you're doing the funeral for. And you need God's Holy Spirit and God's comfort to offer those people. We're not wise enough to write a celebration of life sermon. But the most important thing you can do is spend time with the family and pour out your heart to them. And now we're going to actually look at a funeral message that I preached. And this one was for my father-in-law. He died in 2018, August. And I preached his celebration of life message. And I want you to listen to the message and see how you can also write messages for families who lost a loved one. And I began by saying, that's life. All of us live and all of us will sometime die. That's all part of life. My father-in-law, Bob Boswell, was the most generous and loving man I ever knew. Bob's love and faith in Christ and for his family were demonstrated by his life and actions. When the Boswells visited us from Florida, the first words he'd say were, do Kristen and you need anything? He always looked to other people first. Of the 31,935 verses of the Bible, the one that describes Bob best is Isaiah 32, 8. And it's a New Living Translation. I really like this verse. But generous people plan to do what is generous. 
and they stand firm in their generosity. And he always stood firm being generous with me and my family. Bob loved studying the Bible, science, astronomy, and travel. His favorite vacation was to Egypt and was a combination of the four. When Kristen and Micaiah when Kristen told Micaiah, Grandpa Boswell is in heaven, Micaiah replied, is he in school there? Since Micaiah at two and a half believes school is a coolest place on earth. Life is composed of joy and happiness, but also sorrow and grief. Jesus said, for God caused his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. A theologian once said, Nobody gets through a broken world unbroken. Bob's favorite verses also express the concept of joy and happiness, but also pain and sorrow. The 23rd Psalm was one of Bob's favorite passages of Scripture. And here it is. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet water. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. These are the joy and happy times, the sun shining. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Times of grief and sorrow, that's the rain that we experience that Jesus talked about. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Monday morning, July 30th at 6.30 a.m., Chris and I were awakened to the phone call that everyone dreads ever hearing, especially a child about their parents. Dad just passed away. They were unable to save him. The staff tried their best. Heather choked out as my wife burst into tears, saying, Not so, not so soon. I never got to say goodbye. That afternoon, as I exited our apartment, the friendly maintenance man riding his golf cart asked, How are things with you and your family? And I shared with him about Bob's passing. And he said this to me. That's how life is, he replied. The book of Job, written to address suffering and the problems of theodicy, why does a good God allow bad things to happen? Job 5, 7 states, Yet man is born to trouble. Surely his sparks fly upward. That's how life is. Or Job 14, 1 for 2, Man born of women are few days and full of trouble. They spring up like flowers, wither away like fleeting shadows, and do not endure. In our text today, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, Paul addresses the Thessalonians community, and he looks at their concerns for their loved ones who have passed and how to respond properly to death. The apostle Paul wrote, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or to Grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of our angel with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive in our left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one of these words. And I will share three ways to respond to that's just life. That's just how life is. Number one, don't take life or your family for granted. None of us pro is promised tomorrow. Therefore, live each day as if it could be your last. 
In our text, Paul states, Christ will return with a trumpet blast. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 says, Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? Trumpet blasts in biblical times symbolize a battle. Since we live in a battle time, we need to be prepared and faithfully doing what God has equipped us to do. Bible student approached John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, and asked, what would you do if you knew Jesus would return tomorrow? John Wesley said, I'd work in my garden. The young man was shy and yet, why would you work in your garden? Wesley replied, every day I live as if Christ will return. Tomorrow is my day to work in my garden. We, like John Wesley, should be ready and alert by living each day as if it was our last. In the first century, Rabbi Robert Yakin Ben Yakin, I know I messed up his name, instructed his disciples, if there were a plant in your hand and they should say to you, look, the Messiah is here, go and plant your plant, and after that, go forth to receive him. In other words, every day we live as if the Messiah, Jesus, is coming. Number two, we grieve not as the world grieves, since we know that our loved ones in Christ have eternal security and will, and will be with them again. Bob trusted in Christ as his Lord and Savior. We grieve and cry missing his physical presence as we live our lives celebrating holidays and birthdays, wishing he was there with us, and also grief with hope, knowing we'll see him again in heaven. David, grieving the loss of his son, said, But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. 2 Samuel 12, 23. And this is a real comfort that we know will go be with our loved ones sometime. The book of Job fails to answer the age-old question of why they're suffering, or is a pastor in Austin, Texas said in his sermon, the ending of the book of Job only puts duct tape on the problem with suffering and pain in our lives. After Job prayed and interceded for his three friends, the Lord restored back to him double everything he had lost. Job 42, 12 through 13 says, And the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. Job only received seven sons and three daughters, the same number that he had before. Why were Job's children not doubled like his earthly possessions in Job 1-2 to Job 42-13? The reason Job received only seven sons and three daughters is that unlike his livestock and wealth, Job never lost his children since they are in heaven waiting for him. Thus, from the eternal perspective, Job even received twice the amount of children. Only seven of his sons and three of his daughters are on earth, and seven of his sons and three of his daughters are waiting there in heaven for when he returns to them. Job 14 states, If a man dies, will he live again? All days my heart service, I will wait for my renewal to come. At the renewal to come, we like Job and the Thessalonians community of believers, we will receive our loved ones back. In A History of Heaven, Professor Jeffrey Burton Russell wrote, St. Augustine sits that the paradise at the end of time is a reformation in Numerus. It will restore yet it will be superior to that at the beginning of time. In the first paradise, we had freedom to sin or not to sin, but in the eternal paradise, we are so yielded to God that we can't even sin against him. And that's awesome. The things that hold us back now, the depression, the anxiousness, the sin, whew, in heaven, it's loose. And we're with God and we experience complete freedom. And then, finally, 
Since we have hope in Christ, we encourage each other. Paul wrote in our text, Therefore encourage each other with these words, the hope of the resurrection and Christ's return. When we feel grief and sorrow, we can lean on each other for comfort and love. Some, day, some days will be harder than others. And that's just how life is. I will conclude with this quote I use in my book, Thought, Choice, Action. Rachel Ring, who died in a car accident her freshman year at Oakland University during her senior year of high school, posted on the wisdom tree, and that's the senior high's class parting wisdom. You can be anything you want in life, a doctor, an astronaut, a teacher, an engineer, business person, but just remember to love God every second of the day. That's our response to a world infested with cancer, car accidents, natural disasters, and wars and tragedy. Love and trust God and be his agent of healing and comfort. Let's end in prayer. God, we just pray that you'll speak to our hearts, comfort people who are mourning the death of loved ones, and we pray that your grace and comfort will be upon them. We pray that we'll be agents of comfort to those around us who have lost loved ones and that our words will be words that are in season and bring comfort and healing. Heal, comfort, and let people know that you are God in the midst of suffering and tragedy in a fallen world. Amen. And that's how you preach a sermon. Always lead them back to Christ. Always celebrate the life of the person who's gone on to be with the Lord and always offer comfort to that person. And even more important than just once you preach the sermon is follow up in the weeks, months, in that year following the death of a loved one, comfort the family. The first few weeks after a funeral, everybody's there. But what about six months from there? Are you still there to come from, especially a suicide? I was talking to my family since we had a cousin whose 19-year-old son died tragically of suicide. I said, you know what? We need to visit uncle and cousin and be able to talk to him and make sure, especially a while after. Because right now the family's there, everyone's there. But what about six months down the road? Do they feel our presence? Are we picking up and giving them a phone call or giving them a visit? So I want to encourage you, when you do a sermon of the celebration of life, make sure you celebrate that person and always lift up Christ.